Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. Hope you all can hear me. My name is Thiago Mendes, potato breeder at the International Potato Center. I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya, but uh, this week I'm joining you from Brazil. So today we have uh, three presentations, uh, one uh, from myself and two others from our colleagues from India uh, in Ecuador. Uh, I have a few things here for you. So if you have questions, we have the bottom for questions, right? Please post your questions there. We're looking forward for your interactions and good questions. We also have uh, interpretation English to Spanish. For those who want to listen in Spanish, you can just use the button also below. You're going to find it there. And you can change to Spanish. And uh, what else? Yeah, that's all for now. Okay. Uh, the first presentation is going to be, you know, about 15 to 20 minutes, all the three presentations. First presentation is going to be about enhancing potato resilience challenge and advance in breeding for bacterial resistance in East Africa, followed by a characterization of Equatorian potato wild species, morphological, molecular, and ecogeographical. And this third one is going to be the evaluation and selection of progenies from wild species for late light resistance and also agronomic traits. So let's get started. First, allow me to introduce you to a slide about the Bold Project, uh, the Bold Potato Project, which is a project funded by the Crop Trust. And then if you want to learn more about, you can just point your cell phone to this QR code. It's going to take you to the website that we have under the Bold Crop Trust uh, yeah, project there, so you can get more information about uh, the activities. So, in the case of the Bold Project, we are working on three We are working on three three major diseases, huh? bacterial wilt, drought, and late blight resistance. And as you can see in this slide, you have we have different wild species that we are working, you know, depends on the trait that we are working with. So there are there are some other steps as we identify the source of the, the trait that we are looking for. So then we use it, uh, the particular source, into the main gene pools that we 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 have at SIP. Okay. So you can see that it's a big diversity and we are using this diversity for those uh, traits that you can see on the screen. So I will not get in details about it, but in case you have any questions or want a further explanation about it, we're happy to answer that. So now I'm getting to the webinar, which is uh, my presentation about enhanced potato resilience, challenge and advance in breeding for bacterial resistance in Africa. So the first slide is basically to update the, tell you a bit about what is happening in terms of uh, potato in sub-Saharan Africa, right? Potato is a food secured crop and a crash crop for more than five, five million potato farmers in sub-Saharan. The short, cropping cycle, three to four months. Yeah? And there are places that you can have one to three growing season per year. So cases of Kenya, for instance, that have highlands, we can plant year round. That's why in some regions, shore dormancy is an important uh, you know, trait for farmers. It's an important crop for hunger, hunger month. So another fact is about the area has increased uh, two to six times in the past 25 years. So. It's uh, it's becoming even more relevant crop uh, in in the region. So, but the average yield is still very low. So we are talking about six to ten tons versus a uh, potential to get into forty tons per hectare. So when it comes to bacteria yield, it's a really emerging or re-emerging issue. So we have like results for some publications, especially my colleague Kalpana Sharma. She's been She's a pathologist and she's been working quite a lot on bacterial wilt in the region. And some of the surveys, you can see the numbers 
how much you know bacteria uh, will it's becoming a a a a threat for the potato production in in Africa, right? You have seen that in the East Africa countries, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Rwanda, it's uh the prevalence it's increasing, and also uh, uh the bacteria it's sort of ranging across different altitudes as you see on the graphic on the right so which is pretty much spread all over the potato production areas in kenya so this second slide here this other slide here is to show you that we have uh identify all the phylotypes but the the one that it's most common in the samples that were collected in the region is phylotype 2 so when in Kenya, for instance, you can have, we have both two, but the most common and it's found across all the countries, it's phytotype, phytotype uh, two, which is important for the screening that we want to do in breeding. So we need to identify which is the right phytotype that could bring, you know, resistance across country. And, uh, and of course, when you do the screen, you should use the right one. So as you see, bacteria world and the challenge that we have in Africa and many other regions as well, where we grow potato, uh, it's a combination, right? Of uh, it's an integrated management process, right? That includes diversity, distribution, and epidemiology. That I show a few slides about it. Seed system interventions, uh, seed regulatory framework, and of course breeding and why not transformation for resistance and tolerant variety. So it's rather than just looking to the breeding perspective, it's a combination of all those aspects. So in the case of bacteria world, uh, this work started a long time ago with like crosses that were made in here. So bringing resistance from Commerzoni, as you can see, and then uh, using these hybrids uh, and crossing it with like a tuberosum type and then through a series of back crossing that we named that was named at the time BC1 and then BC2 and BC3. Uh, then it was selected the advanced uh, tetraploid materials with commercial traits, you know, with the, the, the genes from the Solano Commissoni. So it notes here that in some point, this BC2 and BC3, there were seeds like that were shared with Embrapa that has done a good job on selecting in advance. Uh, bacterial with resistant material and also heat tolerant. Uh, so the team has done a good job. Uh, and part of this BC2, which are clones, advanced clones, they were introduced back in, in, in Lima. And those are the ones that we have crossed with like the SIP uh, gene pool that we normally call this pool uh, LB88T, which is late blight and heat tolerant gene pool. So actually, we're crossing the BC2 because the BC3, those are clones that were selected in Brapo, still uh, working with them to see whether we can bring them to Peru or how we can make uh, this diversity from BC3 clones available. Uh, so you see here, we have two sort of space. One is the integration of commercial, the, the genes from wild species into the commercial potato. And another one is getting this tetraploid one and exploring breeding programs. So that's what we, we are doing. So we're gonna see some results from materials from this population uh, BC3 that was uh, shipped to SIP Ethiopia uh, some years ago and, and some results from crosses between uh, the SIP gene pool and the BC2 clones uh, that were selected from this process. So uh, there was a student here, Lila Okiro is a PhD student in Kenya. She took like 26 uh, um, genotypes. Mm, actually it was not 26, sorry. I, I can't remember the number. It was quite a number of genotypes from the BC3 population uh, group or gene pool. And she phenotyped and genotyped it. So the phenotype she did twice, she repeated to try twice. And this is, you can see the results here, how is the progress of the disease because she was evaluating you know, from five days to 30 days. And then you can see the progress. 
And also you can see the graphic about the mortality and the score. So there were uh, uh, no diseases, actually. She reported there was no disease related to the phenotypes uh, after five days inoculation. But 26 genotypes remain asymptomatic even after 30 days, you know, after inoculation. So uh, this was a nice result, especially on the phenotype aspect. It's quite challenging for doing it in bacterial yield. And then the two trials, they were sort of replicated, as you can see. In blue is trial one, and, and in, in orange is trial two. So as you genotype and phenotype both of them, so the genotype, the, the, the data, it was used to just get this diversity analysis, right? You can see that we have a big diversity there. And then also the dots, you can see uh, high, uh, you can differentiate by high resistant, moderate and susceptible uh, based on the type of the dot. And if you see on the right, you can see the crosses, which uh, gave the, the most resistant materials, right? You see that uh, uh, crosses that uh, uh, really perform well in the, in the, against like bacterial wilt. So follow what Lida did back in 2021, and actually was still during the pandemic. Some of those materials same from the BC3, and this was also evaluated by, by Lydia. We still need to cross-check those that were selected by, by farmers and, and, and also with some agronomic data that was collected recently. But we have done like a participatory variety selection because the idea is, okay, so uh, is it those material, uh, you know, good enough for the farmers in Kenya, for instance. So we got them uh, uh, out to the field. The photo that you see on the bottom down was already, I would say the top 15 that they selected and put all them together and now should narrow them down to 10 and rank them. And that's what the exercise was done there. But as you can see on the, on the photo uh, on the right, uh, most of those materials, they have a good shape, I would say for, for the region there, I think it's fair enough. Uh, uh, the quality assessment was not done, culinary assessment, but they are good enough. We also have done, and this is now the crosses between the parents, the BC2 parents with the heat tolerant parents from seed. So we have done inoculation in Kenya uh, just a few months ago, uh, I think. Uh, we got not the amount of plants that we are expecting to die after inoculation. And we're still compiling some results because uh, the tubers that we harvested, uh, we have just planted them in the field. But we get we got like a mortality rate in the greenhouse about uh, 50%. And, uh, and now they'll be planted in the field in the area that we have uh, with a natural infestation. Uh, and some remarks about what we have done with bacterial wilt. Uh, bacterial tolerance is a potential uh, to reduce the losses, right, in the potato. Uh, the collaboration is a key in addressing this complex challenge. A modest breeding, I would say, activities for tolerance, it's ongoing in Kenya. I'm saying modest because we are screening not a bit, large number, we're still adapting protocols to screen large numbers of materials. And as I said, as just connected to this first one, we need to increase efficiency, especially thinking about a sort of high throughput screen approach to evaluate many genotypes and better explore the diversity that we have available. So with that, uh, I wanna thank um, you know, many of the, the organization that's been supporting this work on bacterial build. And um, that's it. So I will stop sharing my my screen. And then, so now I want to introduce the next presentation. It's about the characterization of Icartorian potato white piece that will be presented by Alvaro. So Alvaro. Please, the floor is yours.
We're going to take uh, questions gracias. at the end. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much, Tiago. And hello to all participants. I'm going to share my screen now. This work was prepared with Lisette Ojeda, who is present in the panel. She was hired since November of last year for the project till this November. And we have been able to achieve certain advances related to the characteristics of resistant to late blend, the uh, molecular morphological and eco-geographical uh, characterization for wild potatoes collected in Ecuador. This falls under the project general project coordinated by Tiago and the national project is coordinated by Javier, who will later give you a presentation. So the contents of our my presentation are about two of the activities in the project in Ecuador. One is the characterization of potato wild relatives collected in Ecuador for late blight resistant. And the next activity, and that is the morphological, molecular, and ecogeographical characterization of these relatives. So here I'm going to show we have worked with eight wild uh, species of potatoes, seven of them collected through a crop trust project, and they are in the INIA. Uh, gene back. Uh, so I work in the genetic resource conservation area for INEAP. So the number of accessions for each species you can see here, 13, 14, 24, 7, ad and then 24, albicans 4, chilisensi um, 24, and 20, the, the acule was a material that had been collected in Ecuador about in the 90s. And this is the only solanum that is found in the northern part of America. Then you jump to Bolivia and Argentina. So these are the materials that we worked with. We collected these materials basically in the Andean parts of Ecuador and in the different valleys of the mountain range. So these are the results of the first activity. And I have to say that everything that we are presented with these are preliminary results. We just collected all the information. We've done preliminary analysis, but we still have many analyses to do still. And first instance related to markers associated to late light resistance, Liz had worked on looking for resistance genes that could be run in uh, equatorian materials. So out of those 10 resistant genes, we kept two. R1 that you can see here and gen glutathin S transferasa. And we run this in all the samples of the wild species. So the results, as you can see here, we used two biological samples, one plant one and plant two. And in this country, we can see that for the first gene, 30.77% of the samples had this gene. And for 76 to S, 46% for these accessions, these the accessions that have both the presence of both, you have 20.8% and accessions that don't have any of these markers are 43.96%. So as a summary, we can say that s sensei does not have any markers, albicans and albinorsi do, they have less amplification of two molecular markers and geranium had the highest percentage of air one R1 with 75% and Solanum Colombianum, the highest percentage of the ST1, GST1 gene with 63%. Under this activity, we also had considered establishing the plighty of the material. So we used two methodologies for this. One was the counting of the guard cells of the stomata and for this we 
used a random accession for each one of the species. And we also send it to a lab here in Ecuador. And they use full sectometry to, and we have the results. And these are more or less the results. There were a few problems. We had a few problems with the company because obviously there were protocols to establish loyalty in potatoes and even worse in wild species, but we were able to get results for 68 accessions, as you can see here, Solanum uh, aquale here. You have a reference of the scientific publications that mention the plidity of aquale. We have 100% and tetraploid and accession and sorry for uh, Solanum albicans, the highest uh, percentage is 6x. For albornosi, we have the highest percentage with 2x as published in reference material, but even though there's other triploid material that we have to analyze to see what's happening. It could be a protocol thing, or it could be that there is genetic variation in Ecuador that hasn't been described before. This is possible. We would have to refer to the molecular data. Solanum andrianum, the highest percentage is diploid and a triploid. But in references, they say it's diploid and tetraploid, and chilisense 100% is diploid, as the literature says. Comatophilum 3x and Columbianum, the highest percentage at 43% is tetraploid. Now we're going to look at morphological, molecular, and eco-geographical data for our accessions. To do the morphological characterization, we used 39 descriptors, 30 qualitative and 9 quanti quantitative. Given that there are no descriptors for wild species, we use the descriptors that are already established for uh, farm potato. So we adapted it and I think it worked well. These are the uh, publication of descriptors of, for cultivated potatoes and this is from the 70s and from the 2000s we found a guide for basic uh, morphological identification of wild potatoes. So here we have the descriptors. You can see the descriptors that we used. And here you have some images of uh, of the scales used in the descriptors. So here, this is a quick look and at what we found for each one of the species. You can see the different types of plants that exist. And you have the form of the plant and the colors of the flowers, the shapes of the flowers, the shapes of the fruits. I have to mention that not all accessions, we had the accessions under greenhouse conditions, not all of them flowered or developed tubers. So we have some data that is missing there. Of course, we have to analyze what happened because there are accessions of some species that do flower and others that don't. So we would have to dig in a little bit and we will do this next year. This is a, we used nine qualitative descriptors that were most complete. You can see the genetic relationship based on morphological char characterization of the eight species. So Solanum acale basically is in a different group. It's a different group, but Solanum albicans, and here you have another a uh, group which is Tilosensi albornosi and Minutu volume. And then you have Andrianum colombianum and then Comatophilum that also have specific characteristics. So as I mentioned, this is preliminary data, but this is what we obtained. But we have to continue working on the data and also work on the publication. In the molecular characterization, we used SSRs and 
the INIAP already had some selected a uh, 50 primers for potatoes and for the specific case of wild potatoes Lisette selected 20 polymorphic primers and then we applied we run it with all the combinations for 10 duplex the analysis is done, being done in collaboration with SEEP this is very preliminary data that I'm showing you here. This is a graph of the main coordinates and if and a phylogenetic tree. And uh, you can see here that we have groups per species. So we have Colominum over here and Andreanum and Silicensis over here, Acaule, but there are some species that share some genes there, and you can see the proportion of these in these graphs over here that give you structure. So we have to dig into this a little more. This preliminary result that we developed with SEEP unfortunately did not include farm potatoes that we had as an outgroup to see the genetic distance between wild and cultivated and that would be interesting so we'll continue doing that and working with our colleagues with SEEP but you can see more or less the genetic diversity of the Equatorian collection of wild potatoes now regarding the ecogeographic characteristics here we use this uh, program called cap to fit gen it's promoted by FAO and it allows you to have genetic diversity studies. For this, we chose bioclimatic data, geophysical and edaphic data. This is the this is a data about where it was collected. So according to the point of collection, we can overlap weather, geophysical and edaphic data. So this is interesting information that can be generated. We also have preliminary data. For example, here you can see altitude and you can see the difference in the mean of altitude and it varies quite a bit regarding annual rainfall of the site where these species grow. You can see big variations. And other examples would be average temperature, yeah, it can go from 5 degrees Celsius to 15. So we have big variation for each one of the species. The soil pH, as you can see here, most of them are acid pH, but there's also variation. And we can see that these wild well, species tolerate acid soils. And we also have maps such as the ecological land classification map and here you can find each one of the accessions and we can compare to the specific characteristics to see under which conditions these potatoes are growing in Ecuador. So this is basically what I have for you. It's a summary of the work that we are doing. It's we still have to analyze this data and work on publication. So this is what I have and thank you very much. Now I'm gonna switch to Spanish to make it a little easier. I'm going to complement what Alvaro explained about the activities that the project is executing in Ecuador. Another important activity was the evaluation and selection of progenies that come from wild species uh, developed by SEEP and they have the characteristic of late blight resistance. So what we did in Ecuador was assess that material and see their adaptation to our conditions, our conditions in Santa Catalina, Santa Catalina is 3000 meters above sea level. And we wanted to see the response to these materials. And this was the ideal area for late blight selection because we have identified 12 uh, races of that pathogen.
So my presentation, it, we're gonna, I'm gonna have an introduction. I'm gonna talk about the objectives of the study, the result related to late blight, some agronomic traits, and something that we included, but uh, we considered that was necessary because of the conditions is this new plague that is affecting crops in Ecuador. And we have reports that it's in the north of Peru and south of Colombia, and it's called a purple tip that is transmitted by uh, this insect B. coccarelli and then some conclusions. In Ecuador, potato is one of the main crops given its, well, first broad adaptation to higher areas, uh, the fact that it's cheap and it's versatile. It can be prepared in different ways and it's the base of uh, nutrition here in the highlands especially, but it is one of the crops that has most problems in terms of diseases and plagues in the country. And amongst them, late blight and purple top that is transmitted through this insect that I mentioned before are the most significant ones given that they can bring losses of up to 100%. And in the last few years, we've seen a reduction of crop production in by 40%, mainly due to these two illnesses. And the biggest concern, aside from reducing the area that, of course, coincides with uh, things such as labor, is that there's been an increase in the use of pesticides because the main method for control is pesticides. So to manage these diseases, they have weekly applications of fungicides, insecticides, and even antibiotics. So that bring causes a lot of concern. And so we've been very interested in the use of wild species as possible sources of resistance. This is a viable, interesting option. And as I'm going to show you, works. The objective of the study was to evaluate and select progenies that come from wild species that have uh, late blight resistant and other favorable agronomic characteristics. For this, the International Potato Center in Lima sent botanic seeds from progenies that already had these characteristics. They sent 29 families, 150 seeds per family. This material was planted in nursery conditions and then transplanted to the fields. And in the field, we assess the late blight resistance through weekly uh, evaluations and also calculating the progress curve. We also looked at other agronomic characteristics such as yield, uh, number of tubers, and some other morphological characteristics such as shape, skin, and flesh color. And we also included, not for all of the progenies because that would have been impossible, but for a group that had interesting characteristics, we also looked at the antibiosis for the insect of B. coccarelli. Here we have the results for late blight. We can see this figure where we can see the distribution of the progress of the disease in the families. These are average values and the standard deviation. And this is the control, Capiro. And we see the resistance response is adequate. All of the families present resistance that is significant compared to the control, especially in these groups over here that have areas under the curve that are under 500. And nonetheless, this one, the most susceptible one, is still 600 or 700. So this leads us to see that these materials have interesting characteristics. And here we're going to look at the distribution of progenies and the frequency we can see that more than 80% of the progenies had uh, AUDPC values below 800. So this 
confirms that the progenies, the families, have these resistance features compared to the control that's over here. That has more than 2,000 area under the curve. And here we have an image of material that has late blight. And this is the control over here that had 50% or more affected area. And at the end of the day, this material was 100%, meaning it didn't have any production. It died completely versus this material that where the area under the curve was uh, those values that we showed. And here we have performance, the percentage of frequency of the materials. Here we had a little more variation. We have uh, materials that had low production and materials that had 0 0.94 kilos per plant. And this these are the ones that were included in the selection. Here have the number of tubers per plant which was surprising given that the tubers, as we can see in the image, in some cases, uh, they were over 50 tubers, and in some few cases, 8%, more than 77 tubers per plant. So in some cases, many of these tubers may not have met characteristics of commercial potatoes, but they did have some commercial value that could be used. Here we have an image of the distribution of the frequency for the shape. More than 50% were compressed and the other 50% was distributed in oblong, elongated long oblong, obovate and ovate, etc. And what's interested is what the um, Equatorian consumer is interested in is the depth of the eyes and, and most had this characteristics which is adequate for consumption or for processing so the material is pretty good in this feature now in terms of skin color and flesh color we can see that there is a color distribution mainly for skin color we have brown and yellow, pink, orange, a few red and purple versus for flesh color, almost half is white. We have another percentage that is cream, some values for yellow and bright yellow, which is adequate given that the consumer preference is are these colors. So in the end, we selected the materials that had under the curve values of less than 700 and yields above one kilo per plant. And we selected a total of 129 progenies. And here we have the number that were selected per family with that total of 129, which is a manageable number because in the end, we had more than a thousand materials in the field, which was making their evaluation difficult. Here we also have the uh, results for uh, B. coccarelli antibiosis. So as we can see in this image, we introduced potato leaves into these containers that were sealed and had holes that were covered with mesh so that the insect can't leaf, and we introduced a, a couple, a pair of insects, and then we evaluated the number of uh, the eggs laid every three days. And we did four evaluations and we had three replicates. In this table, we can see the behavior of this characteristic compared to the susceptible uh, control that had 121 eggs. And this one over here that only had 3.9. Most of this material had the same range statistical. The highest value is 16. And our tolerant control had double that. So we have, we're looking at these materials with a lot of interest, given that well, we believe that the leaves have some substance that make them not attractive to the insect. 
So we are working on that. And in the following cycle, we're going to be doing some field tests to be able to duplicate this information. Conclusions. We have identified a lot of variation in the late blight resistance, yield, number of tubers, and the quality traits. Most progenies showed uh, uh, late blight resistance and also quality traits such as uh, shape, uh, skin color, and flesh color that are adequate, meaning what the Equatorian consumers prefer. And some progenies as showed resistance to antibiosis for the B. coccarelli insect. Finally, I'd like to thank the International Potato Center, the BOLD project, my colleagues from the Institute, Tiago, Mariela, Lisette, and Nancy, and my colleagues, Alvaro, Jessica, and Marcelo. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. It's really, it's really interesting to see that even though we are using wild sources, uh, you are well tuned with the local market or the market preferences, right? Well aligned, actually, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, this is what we are supposed to do. But it's really good to know that some of those materials uh, are segregating for for the trades that the local market in Ecuador are looking for is looking for. So we have actually one question here. So first, I just would like to highlight a comment from, from Carolina Castro from Embrapa. He was just mentioning that uh, we, there was like a meeting recently with the gene bank that some of the clones that I mentioned, the BC3 population, that is like a more advanced material selected by Embrapa in Brazil, uh, we uh, are now working on it to have it at seed gene bank international distribution and also making crosses with some of the advanced gene pools that we have. So she just mentioned that she's working with our colleague in the gene bank to make it happen. Thank you, Carol. It's nice uh, to hear that. So we have uh, two questions in the chat box. Um, the first one, Alvaro, is asking about the regulation process. Uh, if you know anything about the regulation process, process regarding the use of chemicals in the Papa in Ecuador and actually and and in Quaislos fungicida and what are the fungicides that it's common use for this? I'm assuming that for, for Punta Morada, no? Uh, I think this is the question. If there is any regulation about the the current 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 pesticides and, and for any any other thing in Ecuador, if you can make a comment about that, Javier. Tiago, I think that this question is for Javier. <laughs> oh, you, I said Alvaro. Okay, Javier, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, gracias, gracias por la pregunta. Entonces, actualmente... Thank you for the question. Currently, the institution that regulates agrochemicals is Agrocalidad, similar to Senasa in Peru. And what they do is they first qualify the pesticides that are in the market and provide authorization for sales for a specific crop and for a specific plague. So right now there's more than 15 registered products for this, but in the market we can find more than 30 that are being used. The question refers to regulation there isn't a regulation about amount. That's why the farmers apply even sometimes every four days, depending on the plague and what they're using most, the farmers. And this is the other part of the question. I understand that you are referring to the insecticides in the chemical group. What they're using most is group 4A in Yacropid. That is... Uh, concerning given that there are reports of resistance in other countries and here it's not published but we have the assumption that it the same thing is happening that is my answer thank you you have another follow-up question to this and this is whether you consider that they should in uh, include bacteria really in the tolerance in for seeds that is included in the new regulation that the Ministry of Agriculture has 
for seats of different categories, not just certified, but all categories. And in terms of severity of the illness, and also because, as you know, this insect actually transmit two causal agents. So, Candidatus bacteribacter, this is a bacteria that is in phytoplasm. So, the regulations related to the three phytoplasms the bacteribacter and the insect so you have the tolerance and the seed inspectors know how to do it and in the end agrocalidad the regulatory entity establishes the molecular analysis to test because sometimes you can't really do it visually so check to check whether there is any doubt there is another question over here I think Alvaro gave an example. What we did in the past was do what we call assisted molecular improvement or enhancement. So we look for molecular markers associated to the late blight resistant uh, genes. So we did a validation of several molecular markers that have been published that work best in our germplasm. And those are the ones that we use. And that's what Alvaro used. So when we have too much germplasm, in the previous case, we had a population of a thousand individuals. We used the molecular markers and we selected ones that had the presence of one or two, meaning both genes or at least one. And we also had the field information for that material. So in the end, we selected materials that have late blight resistance and that's the idea of the project that's why Alvaro showed some of the preliminary results and with these selected 129 materials apply markers and do and do assisted molecular selection more than the challenge I would call it I would say it was a motivation to have to use these wild species because we had only collected and the conservation ones and there's nothing written about these species so because of the project we were able to describe the progenies the morphological characteristics and all that of course that each one of the activities brings challenges so in our case with Lisette, well, basically it was the time. I know it sounds trivial, but it was the time. We only had one year to carry out all of these activities. And so Lisette, in one year, well, well, we were able to do it in one year to get all the information. And right now we are, uh, we have raw data and I feel very optimistic to be able to analyze them more in depth and start to develop a publication. The ploidy part is always a challenge given that we didn't have protocols in the company. Even on how we take the material with liquid nitrogen with ice and then and then they have to test the protocols in the company so this was a challenge we had to even take a living plant so that they could do successive repetitions and protocols and well aside from this we the molecular studies always bring their own innate challenges but Lisa was able to handle them very well she had a lot of experience in uh, molecular uh, late blight resistance characterizations. That's why we chose her to carry out this activity in the little time we had. Because if we had worked with someone who was just starting out, we wouldn't have been able to do it in one year. Well, that's where we're at. We have the raw data, and we'll see how we what we do with it next year. I feel very optimistic. Yes, what we talk about in this topic and others is that the best option for pesticides and fungicides is genetic improvement. We have to select varieties that have resistance and this is what I showed. We have materials that have resistance to late blight and these are the options. So the farmer 
in some cases they would require zero applications in and maybe out of the 21 controls they could reduce that and they can use products that are not so polluting so for me the option really is genetic improvement with other options general options that could be looking for areas that do not have all the races or less favorable conditions for the development of the disease and this can be combined with the practices for example combining other crops intercropping for example so there's other options so in ecuador we're promoting a variety for organic production which is the liver that uh, variety which is resistant to blight and it's worked pretty well of course it has other problems for organic agriculture we can't use chemical products so production is reduced drastically so we have to use other organic fertilizers or maybe make amendments to the soil but there are options and this is we as an institution are aiming towards excellent um yeah, so we, we have no more questions with that. I just want to let you all know, if you have any further questions beyond this webinar, please let us know. We'll be happy to answer it afterwards. You can contact us. I mean, you have our contact on the web page. You can send us an email or any information about the germoplasm or whatever other techniques or manual SOPs, whatever we've been used. We'll be happy to share. We'll be happy to interact with you. And um, it's pretty the last four posts of instances of corona public commissary. I see, I que estamos recebendo uma outra mensagem aqui no chat box, mas assim como já estamos com uma hora de seminar de webinar, só vamos a a cerrar, vamos a finalizar esse webinar. E aí, então, so sorry, so I'm just like jumping to Spanish because of reading the message in Spanish. Uh, yeah, so I just want to thank you all and, and just highlight again that we are fully available to get any information, you know, back to you if you send us email or any other question that you may have for our, our presentation. We are going to certainly organize, you know, new webinars in the near future that we can share more results beyond of, uh, you know, in ESC. Uh, we're certainly going to bring more of our colleagues. Thank you so much. Thank you, Javier. Thank you, Alvaro, Viviana and everyone that helps us with this webinar. Bye.